So good evening and welcome to this uh, second talk in the Kent Field Club uh, winter spring online series. Um, tonight we're going to hear from uh, former president and chairman of Kent Field Club, uh, Renaissance man in terms of uh, many taxa and biological recording, but he's going to talk to us about his, um, I don't know, John, your, your true love, perhaps, in terms of uh, animals. Well, I'm a general, I'm a general naturalist, but I do have some specialist interests. And one of them is, of course, botany, um, but the other is bats. And I guess a lot of my time is taken up with bats because I pick up grounded bats all over Kent, um, amongst many other things. So John's going to talk to us tonight about uh, the search for the Greater Horseshoe Bat in East Kent. Um, please take it away, John. Okay, well, this talk is basically a progress report on Kent Bat Group's search for gr the Greater Horseshoe Bat in Ke East Kent. And I thought I would start from a, an historical perspective. Um, so I am very grateful to Peter and Pauline Heathcote, who researched all this for their um, book, The Bats of Kent, which was published in 1994 by the Field Club. Um, and what they discovered was the first record for Greater Horseshoe for Kent, and indeed the first record for the UK, was 1776 at Dartford Gunpowder Works. The bats were said to be in the saltpeter houses in numbers. Um, as with all gunpowder works, the major hazard, of course, was explosions, and Dartford was no exception. Um, it blew up in 1790, but there is a further note that in 1802, the bats were still present in numbers. We then jump forward to 1835 and 1842, Rochester and Canterbury Cathedrals, um, where the bats were said to be numerous. Now, my guess is um, that all three sites were actually maternity roosts of Greater Horseshoe, and that would make sense from what I know about this particular animal. Um, now, the next record, um, 1908, is just presence absence so there's no attachment to the record so all we know is that um, Greater Horseshoe Bat was recorded in Maidstone, Dover, Rochester Castle and Chalk Church. Now I've had at least two call outs for bats in Rochester Castle they were both brown long-eared bats and they were torpid um, and actually they were within touching distance of the wooden walkways that have now been put in um, to allow public access round the castle. And my guess is from having seen the castle, um, the records were probably of uh, winter animals, probably hibernating rather than, um, uh, rather than maternity roosts. But it's very difficult to know. Um, that's the whole thing about records. Often you need a bit more information. Um, and the final record was a single animal in 1909 at Seven Oaks, and then nothing. And the bat, this particular species, were extinct really in Kent from that time. Um, although um, in 2019, that's two years ago, four independent ecological consultants working um, at four separate proposed development sites um, in um, East Kent in the Dover area, um, recorded this particular bat on sonograms. Um, and those records spanned May to September of 2019. So the bat or bats were around for the whole of the summer. Now, um, in the autumn of 2019, having gained this information, having seen the sonograms and confirmed that this was indeed Greater Horseshoe, um, we had to decide how to move forward. So 
the first thing that was decided was that a project proposal would be written and that was down to me um, and the project proposal had to be um, okayed by our trustees because of course with all of these projects there's always a funding issue and volunteer time so the first thing I did was um, canvas a number of British bat experts that I know to ask them about this particular species because it's not about that I have any expertise within the field really um, and the first um, uh, well I'll come back to this slide let me move on to the project aims from I'm not showing you the whole of the project proposal but the aims were the first three bullet points so I put the fourth one in just for this talk but the first uh, thing was to assess the status of the Greater Horseshoe in East Kent not having been around for over a hundred years and then an attempt to identify foraging areas foraging range um, and location of summer roosts and hibernation sites and then on top of that on the back of that protection enhancements of both the roosts and the surrounding foraging habitats now I put in the fourth thing myself we've been checking out hibernation sites for over 30 years now so all our known sites are already protected really as far as possible by grilling or making sure that the owners um, are in full knowledge of the bat um, um, interest of the sites so back to that um, last slide um, the advice from the bat experts was to start by looking at the hibernation known hibernation sites in East Kent to see if we could find hibernating greater horseshoe now that's easier said than done as I'm going to show you in a minute it's actually like looking for a needle in a haystack first half of my talk is actually going to be on hibernation sites in East Kent well particularly in the Dover area and then I'm going to go on to um, the second part of the talk which is really looking at good foraging habitats so um, hibernation sites this is a photograph taken 25 years ago must be perhaps a bit more um, in around Dover there are as a starter for 10 and there are four Napoleonic forts this is one of them this is the drop redoubt which is on the western side of Dover it's the western heights and originally we accessed the fortification by means of a ladder like this highly dangerous and not something I'd recommend but um, that's what we used to do um, the fort is actually owned as is the next fort um, by English heritage and there is now a, a friend long-standing friends group of the drop run out and they have access and keys um, there is a door um, a metal um, door so the place is as secure as it can be um, and we gain access through English heritage and this group um, the site is a known hibernation site um, it takes about three quarters of a day to check this site it's full of nooks and crannies it's 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 a lot of work just this one site um, and um, it's not only a hibernation site it's also a swarming site I'm not really going to talk about swarming tonight it's a major subject in its own right and if you want to know about, sw about, about swarming behavior the November issue of British Wildlife magazine has a very good article by John Altrincham who is certainly a European expert if not a, well a world expert on swarming behavior in bats it's an extremely good article do read it okay so that was the drop print out this is the Napoleonic fort on the other side of the road still Western Heights this is the detached bastion and it's always been vandalized you can see the graffiti here um, the gun slits um, if they do get blocked by English heritage um, the lads come in with their sledgehammers and knock another hole um, so it's it's a never-ending task trying to keep it secure but 
um, it actually always has access for, for kids. So it's a highly disturbed site. But historically, and that's going back a bit because that's me there with a <laughs> with no grey hair and a black beard. God, that's a long time ago. Um, but um, we used to search this site regularly. And here, this is Tony Hudson and our friend Peter Lena, who's a, a Dutch expert. Both these are actually world experts on um, bats. In fact, Tony is on the IUCN committee on bats. Um, but um, they're both really good. And the picture here of a bat is actually a greater mouse-eared bat. It's one that Shirley took in uh, an Itaperic, which is the biggest known hibernation site in Europe. It's in Poland and it was built by Hitler during the Second World War to protect his Eastern Front. Um, and it's vast and it has somewhere in the region of 37,000 hibernating bats in it, <laughs> including mouse-eared bats. But this animal is exceedingly rare in Britain. We think it's now disappeared from Britain. There was a, <coughs> a single male that was for a long time hibernating in one of the Sussex uh, disused railway tunnels. But this animal, there was an animal, one of these in um, this particular fortification at Dover back in uh, the winter of 1985. And Tony took it down because we needed to know, is it male, is it female, what, what, what about it? It was a, a male that Tony thinks was probably a male from the previous year. And I know there's a maternity roost in North Calais. I know where the maternity roost is. My friend Van Saint-Curries has taken and shown it to me. Um, so it, this is a, a, an interesting site. It is almost certainly a swarming site, but we can't prove it because we can't leave Kit in there. It would be stolen. Um, I, I won't, I will mention there is a, a third Napoleonic fort um, on the Western Heights called the Citadel, which was an immigration removal centre and was owned by the Ministry of Justice. I checked it a couple of times um, for hibernate, and it has hibernating bats. And I tried to get it in, in it in the winter of 2019. But as always, it becomes complicated. My contact, Phil Thomas, who's the ecologist for the prison service, um, <coughs> told me when I emailed him that he'd just retired from the prison service and that the Citadel was up for sale, which it was. Um, and he tried to get me access through the property services department, but they <coughs> didn't work. Um, so I didn't manage to get in there. And it's now been sold to a developer. So the likelihood is we won't be able to get into that site, I think, in the near future, which is a pity. Um, because I suspect it has greater horseshoes in it. But anyway, that's a by the by. Um, this is um, the fourth of the Napoleonic forts round over. This is actually on the eastern heights. It's behind Dover Castle. It's called Fort Burgoyne. And it was built as they all were, of course, in the early 1800s. Um, and there are five bat species using this for hibern hibernate here every year. Um, we're very lucky in that the Land Trust now own this and Nick Tardeville here, um, back group member and very good ecologist, um, is the ecologist um, for this site and works for the Land Trust, um, trying to um, direct their um, the works that they're doing there. There's a lot of possible development. We're trying to protect the bats that are here. It's a major hibernation site. We also know it's a major swarming site. We're working on the swarming behavior. We're doing trapping, etc. there at this particular site. Um, across the road from Fort Burgoyne is um, Dover Castle. And Dover Castle is full of underground sites. Um, not only is it um, a castle improved by Henry VIII, it's also <clears throat> got a lot of Napoleonic fortifications there. And Shirley Thompson here in the past has led um, groups with um, one of the um, staff at English Heritage checking 
some of the site, some of the underground structures there, and there's always hibernating bats there. Um, it's a it's a very good site for for bats. Um, I also haven't mentioned all the World War Two sites around Dover. There's um, some there's St Martin's Battery, which is a World War Two um, deep shelter for the gun emplacements there. There's also at least four deep um, underground potting rooms and shelters at St Margaret's Bay, again associated with the big guns that were trained on the um, French coast. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of sites, and then on top of that, of course, <coughs> Dover sits on the chalk, and chalk was always a valuable commodity, both for marling land for building purposes. Lime mortar um, was the um, uh, uh, building material, so anyone with um, a lime kiln and access to lime uh, to, to chalk. Um, was in the money. Um, this, in fact, is a chalk cave. It's just to give you an idea of the sort of size of most of the chalk caves we encounter. This actually is on Thanet. This is Quex Park. These are, there are five adits, um, as we call them, off one of the chalk quarry faces. This one goes back, well, all of five of them here go back about 50 yards. They're, they're quite big. But note that they're all curved. They all have this sort of arch shape, which gives the, uh, more strength to the roof and tends to prevent cave-ins. Um, though modern tractors and modern equipment is very heavy and, and often stuff opens up when um, tractors drive over. Um, the other um, chalk, um, mines that are available to bats and very good actually hibernation sites around um, East Kent, well around the Dover area really, are Dean Holes and this is Rod Laguerre's um, drawings of a, how, how Dean Holes were worked. Dean Holes were basically vertical shafts, they were vertical chalk mines. Um, <clears throat> the, the miners would dig down to the chalk they were after and then they would dig out. And in fact, I think that um, most of the mining was actually done by farm labourers in the winter when there wasn't so much to do on the land. Um, and they would literally pick um, with the pick here, um, the chalk, put, put it in the, in, the, in the basket, and then the winchman would winch it out. And this chalk was used to mile the land. It was used to improve the um, clay, very usually often heavy clay with flints um, to make the, the land basically workable. Um, so most of these Dean holes were dug on site, they were dug on farms. There were thousands of them dug on farms. Um, and some of the medieval ones, they go back a long way, some of the medieval ones actually have footholds in like this. They spiral up the shaft, which um, helps the um, the, the, the miner here uses the footholds to help his win winchman winch him out when he's finished mining um, for the day. That's a Dean Hole at, um, actually it's at um, Ludgate Lane, which is Kingsdown near Tenham, East Kent again, but not so close to the coast. Um, but it's just to give you an idea, what we do is we use these caving ladders, which are rolled up, we unroll them and drop them down. So they're flexible ladders and you have to climb down. It's quite a technique. Um, you climb down, you're roped up so that if you fall, you just hang there like a spider. Um, but um, it, this particular Dean hole is about 35 foot down before you hit chambers. This one is Dad Man Shore Dean hole. This is our deepest Dean hole. I reckon that's foreshortened this, um, here, but this is a 50 foot climb. I know it's a 50 foot climb because I do it and it's hard work <laughs> getting out. Um, at the bottom, this particular Dean Hole has six chambers and they are big. This is me standing on um, a, a chalk dome of, of um, 
chalk debris that's probably a, a originally a, a collapse of a, of a roof but this is about 30 foot high and most of them are 30 foot high and they're very difficult to to check um, this is Mosling's hole this is close to where we have recorded um, this as you'll see in a minute we have recorded Greater Horseshoe and um, this is very close to that uh, record uh, that that recording that farm um this particular dean hole we tried to access last winter um and there were three tons of sticky yellow clay that had slipped in the autumn because it was so wet 2019 was very wet too uh, and there'd been slippage and i managed to persuade managed to persuade my kerg kent underground research group mates um, to dig it all out for me so this um, summer gone we spent it took them half a day to dig it out and into buckets and then we had to bucket it away um, it was quite a rigmarole but they cleared it and Paul cleared the sides to try and stop future slippage but this is a very important site because again it's a swarming site as well as a hibernation site um, all of the underground sites I've shown you now uh, so far uh, 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 must be um, swarming sites so we we can't prove it with those that are easily accessible because we can't leave the kit in there it's too expensive that's a photograph taken by Terry Whitaker who's a professional photographer this is another Dean hole this is a Dean hole in Kingsdown Wood um, near Bluetown um, which is sort of I suppose Doddington Torrey Hill way um, <clears throat> it's um, again it just gives you an idea of the chambers to see how big they are um, they're all dug on the same sort of format um, and then finally this was our um, target species um, Claire Munn who is in the group but she's also uh, the ecologist for English heritage at Dover Castle and she had recorded Greater Horseshoe actually at the castle both um, in 2019 both at the um, uh, in the grounds of, of, the, of the castle and also in one of the underground passages there Horseshoe Passage uh, no Hudson Passage which we know is a swarming site so she recorded um, a greater horseshoe in September of um, 2019 and she was searching in December this year late December and she was looking in horseshoe passage um, <laughs> appropriately named although it's actually named for the for the arch but anyway um, and she recorded this is a greater horseshoe horseshoe bats when they hibernate um, they wrap their wings around them um, and with lesser horseshoes they're much smaller than greater horseshoes but you can't see the any any features um, with lessers whereas you can with greaters so this was the first visual evidence of greater horseshoes since 1909 in Kent and interestingly in 2012 Peter Scrimshaw, this is my go-to technician. Peter is a genius with technical stuff. He builds our, our bat activity loggers. And we set one of these up in one of the um, uh, rooms at the end of Horseshoe Passage. This was a, a sort of barrack room um, because we thought it might well be a swarming site. There was access from the moat. I'm not going into details of the the building of napoleonic fortifications but they all had moats around them dry moats that were designed to um send the invading troops up the moat where they'd get shot to pieces by our troops um uh, with their guns pointing out of gun slits anyway um peter was setting up a a, a bit of kit here um we assumed the bats would be coming in and swarming and they are indeed and that bat you just saw, that greater horseshoe, is actually I'm I, I'm the photographer for this. So the, the 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 bat was in a little blind passage behind me, 
and we intend we hope um to um take the bat down if it's still there in the end of the march we're waiting for a, a natural england license to okay it um but uh, nick tardeville is going to um handle it and ring it we'll process but it's important that we check the animal to make sure it's whether it's male or female if it's female and has bred that would tend to indicate we have a maternity roost in um, the area <coughs> which is of, of great importance to us um, so we hope to do that um, probably in the next couple of weeks but it's subject to natural England who are unbelievably slow um, but anyway um, that's that's again part of, uh, of this project now second part of the talk um, this is all thanks to Dan Chewson. Dan is um, his official title is Natural England Land Management Advisor and Dan has spent the last two decades working at a landscape scale on biodiverse grassland restoration throughout East Kent. He's been working on a vast scale and we are actually looking at a small patch that he's been working on. Um, and when I asked the experts to so the sort of habitat we should be looking for greater horseshoe foraging, um, the message from everyone was look for biodiverse grassland that's grazed part of the year um, or meadows that are grazed throughout the year with mature hedge lines or mature woodland around them and I mentioned this habitat to Dan whom I know well and Dan said well why not go for the five valleys and to orientate you, this is the Lydon Valley. This is the Lydon Valley cut through by the River Dower, which comes out here at Dover. There's Temple Yule, so Lydon Temple Yule Reserve is here somewhere. Um, and then to the west are five valleys. There's one here, that's um, two, three, four, five. There's five valleys, as I will show you. Here are those valleys, just to orientate you again, that is the Lydon Valley here. There's the sea, of course, and here are the White Cliffs. And then we have Elmsvale, which is the closest one to the sea. And then Coombe Valley, Olcombe Valley, Water's End, which is squatter and not quite so long. And then the Warren Valley, which runs round into the Lydon Valley. So we were targeting these five valleys to put static bat detectors in. And this is Dan's map. All these are Dan's um, slides. Um, this is Dan's map showing what he's achieved um, in, in the area where we are um, attempting to target greater horseshoes. This is the area, um, this is just, just a small part of what he's been doing. Just to orientate you again, that's the Lydon Valley and the blues aren't water bodies. These are chalk grassland that are managed or owned and or ma managed and or owned by wildlife bodies. So that's um, Lydon Temple Yule, which is KWT owned and managed. That's Old Park, which is actually owned by Dover Harbour Board, but managed by KWT. Their attempt in chalk grass and restoration. And these are various other chalk bodies. Um, uh, I think that's probably Nemo down, but I, I, anyway, it doesn't really matter. These are all public access but very well managed chalk grassland, but they're public access. And what we didn't want to do was to put our 800,000 quids worth of kit um, where the public could get at them and nick them. So we've avoided those public access sites. Now, the rest of the map, the green is woodland. So there's quite a lot of woodland. 
The yellow is remnant chalk grassland. This is old uh, relic downland. <clears throat> and Dan has initiated and made sure that these are in appropriate management. Um, the orange, the orange here, is restoration grassland. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that. I'll show you what that, that is in a minute. And the reds are um, arable reversion. So that's reverting arable land to, um, uh, uh, to basically to biodiverse grassland. And this is all about Dan managing the um, stewardship grants for landowners and persuading them to go ahead with um, uh, uh, using the grants appropriately. Um, and finally, the pink is, uh, these are legume lays. For those of you that listen to the archers, um, this is Adam's favoured herbal lays. Um, the legume lays are really good from the point of view of pollinators, though <coughs> they're obviously not as diverse as the, the grasslands that um, Dan's been restoring. So, how do we go how does is dan going about the getting species richness uh, within grassland he's doing various techniques he's using natural regeneration um a lot of the arable of course is sprayed with roundup glyphosate which is pretty toxic stuff um but in fact the um the seed bank there is still some seed in the seed, seed bank that hasn't been destroyed. So when you um, start to try to generate um, diverse grassland, some of it will regenerate from seed. However, um, what Dan has also been doing, he's been getting the farmers to use native provenance uh, wildflower seeds um, as the basis. Um, and then on top of that using green hay spreading so he's been getting the farmers to take hay from some of these relic downlands and using that hay to try to increase the diversity <clears throat> these techniques the green hay spreading and sometimes the native provenance wildflower seeding has also been used on some of these so-called semi-improved um, agricultural grasslands which are mainly rye so he's been using this technique and he's covered a big area this is just east kent valley's grassland project and that's covering 65 square kilometers of downland country that's all come lidden what well, anyway you can see read that um but basically since 1995 his arable reversion that's 148 hectares and the wildflower seeding and green hay spreading projects that's basically in um, agriculture improved grassland 108 hectares so it's a big area and that's 76 sites in total so it's big areas these are just farmers doing some of this and then of course once you've got your grassland you need to manage it properly so the farmers are all being paid for this and remember that a lot of the um soil um on these farms is actually thin clay heavy clay with flints um and it's not very productive um in order to get a a, a decent wheat crop or whatever from the soil you have to put a lot of input and that only makes a profit really because um, the fertilizers subs are subsidized, as are the insecticides and the herbicides and things. So um, you can make as much money with these um, uh, environmental stewardship schemes as you can from actually getting the, the crop off. So that's, and it's easier work. Remember too, a lot of the farms that Dan is dealing with do have cattle um they're often they do have beef herds so actually um the, the the management is for some of these is by hay cutting that's hay cutting here and hay cutting here um hay cutting is a useful crop for winter time for um animals that are have, having to be kept inside 
um, so it, that works. Um, and then aftermath grazing. So you, after you've done your hay crop, you're grazing with um, mainly cattle. Seventy-five percent, Dan tells me, of the aftermath, well, of the grazing, is actually done by cattle. The rest is sheep. Um, and I think he's got a couple of farms that are using horses. Um, some are managed by grazing, rotational grazing throughout the year. So it depends on the farmers and what they want to do um, and what's best for them. So I'm now going to run through the, um, the valleys so you can see where we've been targeting for our bat detectors. Um, this is Elms Vale. This is the nearest um, uh, uh, of the valleys, the chalk valleys, to the coast. This is very close to the White Cliffs, very close to the sea, in fact. And just look at the habitat. <laughs> this is um, uh, this is Dyer's Greenweed. It's not a common plant, I don't think. Now I I have to go out my way to find it nowadays. Dyes greenweed is not common. And then there are various orchids um, on this site. Um, this is common spotted, but there, I know we had Tway Blade and um, I think um, Pyramidal. But um, I actually looked at this particular meadow with, well, and, and the rest of, of this farm um, with Sue Buckingham. And Sue went into raptures about the meadow. We had um, clove scented broom rape in here, which of course is rare plant register. Um, mm. But um, it's just to show you the diversity. And if you look at the habitat, um, what's happened in the bottoms now, um, this is all arable, re is, is arable reversion. And so this is all grassland and Dan is encouraging hay cuts up here to be spread the uh, green hay uh, so that the, you get reseeding from the the remnant grass and down into the bottoms and when you look to the other side of the coombs uh, th this is gr cattle grazed um, uh, with scrub and of course the bottoms have got good tree line hedge lines um, in which is ideal for greater horseshoes um, and that's Peter putting up one of our detectors um, I put this slide in really just to show you Dan. This is Dan Tewson, who's really brilliant here. But he's, one of his major skills is people skills. He's really good. The farmers love him. They all get on well with him. And this last here, Sam, is the daughter of the family that actually owned this farm. And she's really keen on her wildlife. So she's keen on what we're doing and listens to what Dan <laughs> tells her. While we were there, she showed me a picture on her phone of a beetle. She asked me, what do you think this beetle is? <laughs> I found it in the garden. And I looked at it, I thought, I it's an oil beetle. <laughs> and the only place I've seen oil beetles is in the med. Um, and I realized when I got home and checked it out that Bug Life have got a project on oil beetles because they're obviously rare in the UK. So I've encouraged Sam to let KMBRC have the record. Um, hopefully she's done that. Um, that's looking back down the valley towards the farm. And again, you can see the habitat, good woodland round and about. That This is all grassland, this is all grazed well hay cut and then aftermath grazing this farm it's mainly with sheep but last summer um, of an evening Hazel and I with Sam counted 110 I think it was common pipistrels out from this gable from the farm and while we were standing there counting we had six serotine bats flying uh, feeding over our heads and up and down this tree line it was just magical um they didn't come from the farm um they came i think from one of these other um uh, 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 properties um in the top end of the valley there's only three pro three other properties at the top end of the valley so um covid permitting that's a job to try and find that roost this summer i think Okay, next valley over is Coombe Valley. These bare areas now um, 
have actually, uh, they're mainly arable reversion now, so they're no longer bare areas. But again, the Coombe Valley, look at all of the, um, the diversity. I mean, there, that's field scabious, that's um, probably wild carrot, could be um, yarrow, I guess, um, agrimony, um, more um, field scabious. I mean, it's a, a whole ad mix again. And look how you've got good mature woodland around the edges of the coombs as well in this valley. And of course, it's all um, cattle grazed. So you've got dung, um, which is very important. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this is where we've got our detector in this valley. It's on this mature um, hedge line, tree line. There's a, a dead ash there, presumably ash dieback. No doubt that ash will go too um, at some stage. But this is all grazed by cattle, but it's not it's minimal it's just uh, they have a f maybe a dozen cattle in there so it's never overgrazed. and I was very impressed while I was there with um, Peter and Dan <coughs> sorting out the uh, the bat detectors I was impressed there are a lot of um, uh, of fragrant orchid flowering there now I think fragrant orchid has disappeared in the last 20 years. It seems to have diminished on all the chalk grasses I get to. It, it's, it, it's not very common. And yet there were, were big numbers here. I actually told Sue about it and she went back to have a, a look. Um, so the third valley in is the Olcom Valley. And again, look at the plant diversity. There's marjoram, that's I think wild carrot. Um, there's harebell, um, there's um, leucanthemum in there, um, there's gallium virum, uh, ladies bed straw, um, salad burnet, and I think the orange, if it's that orange, is probably going to be horseshoe vetch rather than lotus corniculatus. it doesn't matter. It's just very diverse, <coughs> which means the insect species are there and diverse and bats eat insects. And this is where we've got our detector. This grassland here is very rich, actually, if you look at it on your hands and knees, you realize how rich it is. But we've got our detector in this mature hedge line. And from what I'm told by the experts about horseshoe bats, they feed, they're not quite like the rest of our bats. They don't just do um, forage in flight. They will forage in flight, but what they do predominantly as an energy saving device, they will hang up on one of the branches of the trees and they do what the flycatchers do. They wait for the big insects to come to them and then they'll fly out and catch them and maybe go back to the perch and eat. So the greater horseshoe are feeding on very similar insects to serotines and noctules. They're taking um, things like chafer beetles and dung beetles and larger moths. So they're feeding on that sort of um, insect variety. And these habitats will, will you know, uh, produce all these sort of um, insects. Now, fourth valley in, this is water's end. It's relatively short and squat. Um, but again, look at the diversity of the grassland. Um, interestingly, um, a lot of these farms on, this is MOD land, and quite a lot of these farms on MOD land are um, beef farms. Um, and this is no exception. The tenant that's here has been here for, oh, 50 years or more. He's been there a long time. Um, and there's, but of course there's butterflies. I think that might be chalk hill blue. I don't know. I'd need you expert entomologist to tell me that. Um, these photographs, these are all Dan slides. So he's been, these are all his photographs. Um, this is a fairly recent um, re arable receding, which I'll show you more of, but you look at the diversity of the plants in there. Um, this is the reseed. All of this field is uh, is arable reversion. 
it's all seeded about two seasons ago, three now. Um, and it's very, it's still pretty diverse. Um, and we have our detector behind me. I did took the photograph and behind me is a mature hedge line and we've got our detector in, in there. And um, the reason we've put our detectors in these sort of habitats is because these are all uh, private farms. I mean, people do wander on them, but we're, it's highly unlikely they're going to come across our um, detectors. Um, and this is the final one. This is the Warren Valley, which is narrower. Um, and again, look at the diversity. There's ladies' bed straw, um, Leucanthum and Moxide daisy. Um, there's um, purple red clover in there. There's um, th there's wild carrot and more ladies' bed straw, and it's just very diverse. And that's Peter going to put up um, a detector or check a, a detector. We've got the detector in this hedge line here. Um, and um, I'm going to now show you some of the results in a minute. Um, this is the machine that um, Peter decided we should be buying. This was um, a static bat detector that has been produced by Wildlife Acoustics, which is an American firm. Um, it was first on the market in March of last year. So we were effectively troubleshooting for the firm. And Peter is very good at that sort of thing. It was his job once upon a time. Um, I won't go into details what he did, but he's, he's so good with these things. And the detectors are run by four rechargeable AA batteries um, and the card. And what Peter did, he set the um, detector to trigger recording only above 60 kilohertz. Now, the idea for that is that you try to cut out as much as you can of the pipistrel um, calls because we're not really looking for pipistrels. We're looking for greater horseshoe bats, which are actually echolocating around 80 kilohertz. So we, we put the, the kit to try and trigger much higher. Um, and Peter found that three weeks the batteries lasted a good three weeks, as did the cards. Um, and we were changing the batteries, or well, Peter was, every three weeks and downloading the, well, changing the cards as well. And the first download from the Elmsvale um, detector, we had a greater horseshoe. That's greater horseshoe. They have a very distinctive echolocation call. Um, on detector and also on sonogram. It's a very distinctive, you can't really mistake it, it's greater horseshoe. So these were the results from the five farms. Um, we did have some problems, we had some hiccups. We The first hiccup of course was Covid, so we didn't manage to get the detectors out as early as we hoped. We didn't the first three farms, the first three detectors, um, we got them out on the 5th of June. That was the first um, we could make it out. Um, and the second two was later, with, uh, at the first lot download, we put the two further ones out on the 26th of June. So we were restricted in the first part of the year with, our, um, uh, with the data. And then we subsequently happened that there was a problem with the software um, and the software failed in September and didn't um, record any files at all for any of the detectors. So we had no recordings for September. Um, Peter's been in contact with the um, technical department in Wildlife Acoustics. He's been discussing it all with them. Um, but it's it's been fixed now. But then, of course, in October, with all the heavy rains, <coughs> the seals on the detectors failed. So we had to send all of the kit back to uh, the manufacturers and they replaced all the seals. But in spite of that, what we've got is this single greater horseshoe pass um, in June it, on, in Elms Vale. But the thing that struck me most was uh, about it all was the number of serotine passes we were picking up. Now, serotines, echolocate predominantly at 25 kilohertz. 
Um, so we had the trigger set at 60 kilohertz. But what Peter tells me is if a serotonin is flying directly towards the microphone, the harmonics from its call um, will sometimes trigger the um, recording. So um, there was that. But we also, Peter was telling me, that you can't keep pipistrels down, you still record lots of pipistrels. But some of these pipistrels that were setting off the recording, serotines, Peter was finding serotines when the, um, uh, the, record, the bat detector was being triggered by the, um, by the pipistrels. So that's really impressive, the serotines. It was also impressive the number of myotis species the myotis genus, I don't believe you can separate them on um, sonograms. There are some, um, especially some um, consultants that think they can use algorithms for um, sorting out all of the detect all of the um, uh, their recordings, but you can't. Um, the algorithms make mistakes. And Peter looked at all the files, thousands of them by eye, by on, on, on computer screen. So he's gone through them all properly. We've also had some noctules, not many because noctules fly quite high. Um, they echolocate loudly, but you're not getting direct um, uh, uh, at the microphone. So it, it's not surprising that we didn't pick up many noctules, but noctules are disappearing just like, um, uh, like the serotines are, which is quite interesting. Um, and I'm briefly going to talk about serotines. It's only going to be brief because I realise that time is tight. Um, but serotines are a big bat. Um, we've got three big bats in Kent and four with the greater horseshoes are the same sort of size. But serotines are um, a big bat they're a pasture specialist. Um, of the maternity roosts that we've been counting, we realise that um, they've been going down in number slowly but steadily since we first started counting them 30 years ago. Numbers are going down. And we were worried that this was going to be the next bat that was going to get go extinct in, um, in East, certainly in East Kent, if not in Kent. Um, so we actually um, produced a leaflet. Um, KWT asked about, they were doing a whole thing on Kent BAP, the Kent Biodiversity Action Plan. This was in the 90s. Um, and they asked us about what we, which bats we thought should be a Kent BAP species. And we, we realized serotonin should be. And interestingly, this was written, Shirley wrote most of this, although she had input from all of us. But it was interesting, we described the habitat and what should be encouraged and grazed pasture, because these are um, specialist um, feeders on beetles. They go for maybugs in the spring, that's the, 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 the cockchafer. And then later in the in the summer, they go for the summer chafers and the garden chafers. But they also go for dung beetles. Um, and these are all pasture, of course, um, uh, insects. Um, one of the problems with cattle um, is that farmers have been using in the past and still are using these avermectins, which are an anti-helminth but they kill everything. They are very toxic and they come out in the dung and they're persistent in the dung. These avermectins really are quite persistent and they will knock off the larva of dung beetles um, or make them distorted and deformed. Um, so we think it's a whole combination that has knocked out the, um, the serotonin population. Um, the other thing that, this, that you often find with serotines is they feed around large hedges and tree lines, which is exactly what Dan's been encouraging for 20 years. Um, we got an artist to draw the habitat for, for serotines, and you could actually interpret this as um, greater horseshoe. It's ideal for greater horseshoe too, 
so you've got um, uh, hedge lines with individual big trees you've got the cattle grazing in the cattle pastures you've got a pond you've got it, it goes on this is exactly what we were wanting and Dan's been promoting it the other thing about serotines is that they are obligate um, house roosting bats they're at the northern end of the range so they are uh, and they go for these um, properties that were built at the end of the 1800s early 1900s with very um, acute um, uh, 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 roofs with very um, uh, uh, with, with very sharp uh, roofs so it, it, there are reasons for that it's a temperature thing um, but a lot of these properties are were actually very desirable and when farms started to fail um, and were taken over by the big conglomerates the farm buildings were off the farmhouses are often sold and when you get new people coming in especially urban dwellers that come out into the country you find the bats roosts get destroyed um, in spite of the fact they're supposed to be protected so there's a whole combination of factors at work here but it's interesting that this bat which is a greater horseshoe um, is favoring the same sort of habitat as both serotines and noctules it's they're after similar insects um, note this um, large nose leaf and one of the problems with sighting bat detectors with this animal it uses its nose leaf rather like you would a megaphone it actually um, directs the sound so their echolocation um, calls are very directional so you only have to have your detect your bat detector whoops your bat detector on the wrong side of the hedge um, or pointing in the wrong direction and you won't pick this animal up so they're actually very difficult um, to record but this was an animal we were very lucky we were invited by my friend Vincent Coes um, who he runs the North Pas de Calais um, back group but he invited Kent back group over to um, well to Boulogne basically <coughs> to help him with his um, work on swarming sites he actually traps at swarming sites to get um, an idea of populations and he was trapping at two sites um, in Boulogne one was a chalk mine an old chalk mine and the other one was a World War II V2 rocket site and we caught three of these greater horseshoes or rather Vincent did um, at, um, at the V2 rocket site um, which is interesting because they don't swarm like the myotis swarm really they will be there but they're anyway it, that's just another subject really so we caught three of these animals um, but the ones we caught that were really interesting, we caught a lot of Jeffroys. Now, this is Myotis emarginatus. Emarginatus because of the notched, and it's um, known as the notch eared bat. Um, and it's rather gingery. It's actually very much like a Natura's bat, <coughs> but has more gingery fur. This animal is not really found here. However, <coughs> Amanda Miller from the Sussex Bat Group, who collects grounded bats like we do, picked up one of these grounded, I think, in New Haven or one of the coastal um, towns um, last year, um, probably coming across from, I would imagine, from France. So I asked my friend Vincent about his greater horseshoe roosts, and he has two greater horseshoe roosts that he knows about. One is in Montreux, which has about 200 adult females, and one up here near to Calais at Andres, and that has about 20 adult females. Now, you can see where Dover is, and it isn't really that far for a big bat to get across, but I spoke at length with Professor Fiona Matthews, whom I know well, who's now at Sussex University about this, and she said, well, John, I'll send you a genetics paper on greater horseshoes and there is no evidence that 
um, of genetic mixing between the European population and the British population. So at the moment, as far as we're aware, they don't cross the channel. But we do need to know um, where our animals have come from. <coughs> I'm assuming it's more than one. We know that the nearest population to us in Kent is actually Dorset. Um, that's the nearest real population. There is one maternity roost that was found two years ago in West Sussex. Tony Hudson is desperately trying to rescue this um, horseshoe roost. It's got seven adult females um, in this particular roost in Sussex. So I don't think they're providing um, our animals. I think they're more likely to either come from Dorset or from um, France. And Vincent tells me that he will supply me with um, genetic material from his animals if 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 we get um, material from um, um, from our animals in East Kent, so we can work out where they've come from. So, what are we going to do for 2021? Um, we want to continue with the static detectors um, at the same sites as last year. To get a four years data we've actually got four more static detectors they're expensive and we're very lucky to have um, uh, uh, sponsors for, the, for these um, I'll show you at the end but um, the last lot and Dan has found us some money from um, Natural England there's a fund that Natural England have put um, are wanting um, to use for us to use for these particular well this is a uh, the greater horseshoe is a back for, is one of the two bat back from the brink um bats um so um they're they're very interested in um, what we're doing um so we've got now got nine detectors and we're hoping to target the other side of the coom the, the the other side of the valley the other coom uh, of, of four of the valleys we're also looking at possible driven transects, so driving um, the valley bottoms because they're fairly quiet, those country roads, and we could drive slowly with a, um, a bat logger detector, which records um, just to see if we can pick up greater horseshoes that way. I'm also looking at the possibility of doing a walked transect, um, uh, walk transects on perhaps Linden Temple, Yule or one of the other um, uh, 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 grazed, uh, wild uh, conservation grazed um, uh, uh, reserves. Um, that's all subject to COVID, of course. Um, and I would like to search some of the outbuildings, the farm outbuildings for roosts. Um, and of course, Dan's got access to a lot of these via the farmers, which is really good. And of course, we're going to continue with the um, the site checks and the final slide just the thanks to the various photographers including Terry Whittaker who's a professional photographer um, Dan Tewson of course for his for all everything he's done for us including supplying me with the habitat restoration slides and photographs um, Peter Scrimshaw for all his technical expertise and bat detector analysis he's done vast amounts and the funding and we've had funding from Natural England from Kent Mammal Group have supplied us with a, a detector. Kent Bat Group of course have paid for one themselves. Coralis Ecology have supplied us with one and the Nikki and Eileen Barber um, Trust has supplied us with a couple as well. So um, it's all round. It, it's working well. We just, Covid and other restrictions have obviously limited us. So that's it. So over to you, Simon. I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, and if anyone wants, Dan did a, um, a very good article for CLM, Countryside Land Management Mag, uh, Mag which is um, uh, an offshoot from British Wildlife. And he's done a whole article on his um, grass and restoration in Kent. And it's, it's a very good article. He's also, I'll supply Simon with the, link to Dan's video. He's done a video um, showing some of this, the grassland that he's been working on with the farmers. So that's it. Over to you Simon.